50% off coupon. So if there are any supplements you need, you can use that today upstairs in our store. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, I'm really, really excited today to have Dr. Sean Hubbard um, come. He actually spoke last year, and it was one of our most well-received lectures um, of 2017. So I'm really excited that he's back and especially excited too because he has moved his practice into one of the domes here at the Reardon Clinic. And so he's close and um, handy and he's, he's great, to, great to consult with and pick his brain. And so I'm, and we're really fortunate that he's here today to talk a little bit more about memory. And in case I forgot to let you guys know, memory, I know, right? Ironic. Um, <laughs> That uh, we, Dr. Dr. Sean and I are going to be doing a brain masterclass series. So, okay, I think we are ready to go. So I am going to let um, Dr. Sean Hubbard tell you a little bit about himself and, um, you know, a little bit about his story, and that will kind of help frame what we're going to talk about today. So, so welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. So my name is Dr. Sean Hubbard. For those of you that don't know me, if you do know me, it's still Sean Hubbard, okay? <laughs> so it works out that way. Most of us have experienced something in our lives where we went into a room with a plan to do something, walk into that room, we get there, and we're like, hmm. What am I doing here? Right? This is some of the things that happen within our working memory. All right? So the question I always get as a licensed chiropractor in Kansas, what the heck does a chiropractor do with the brain and how would you get involved with it? Right? So here's a short little story about how it happened. About six and a half years ago now, I had a patient of mine call, and she said, my world is spinning around my head. It's tilting on a 45-degree axis. I can't get out of bed. I keep falling. Things are not great. What can I do? I've been to the ER. They said it's not a stroke. There's nothing terrible going on along those lines, but life sucks pretty bad. So she that started her journey, and unfortunately for this young lady, it was the best she was going to feel for the next 14 weeks of her life. As time went on, the world started tilting more, started moving more. People moved towards her. It looked like they were being shot out of a gun, moving at thousands of miles an hour at her. The, world, the floor rolled in on her. It's like the crashing waves, but they were constantly going in and in and in on her. So when she would try and walk, the floor didn't make sense. The room didn't make sense. Things were spinning. Her 10 by 12 room she was in most of the time appeared the size of a cathedral to her. So her whole world had shifted. Specialist after specialist, doctor after doctor, a lot of resources were exhausted trying to find out what was going on with her. When they finally saw the specialist of all specialists in our great area, he gave her the most honest thing he could. And he said, look, I have no idea what's going on with you. I can tell you're suffering. My suggestion is you go home and pray that it disappears the same way it showed up. That didn't sit super well with her, but you know, it was the truth. They and their family started looking around and they found a doctor in Atlanta, Georgia, who specialized in balance and dizzy disorders and problems within the brain. They called down there, faxed all the records. They said, hey, sure, we'd be happy to see her in six months because that's the earliest we can get her in. Well, happily for them and a little chaotic for them, Friday after Thanksgiving, they get a call and said, hey, you have any chance of being down in Atlanta, Georgia on the 29th? Which her husband said, sure, of December, that's great. You know, that's five months earlier than we planned on doing this. Well, we kind of mean Monday. So Monday comes, and they're in Atlanta, Georgia. They had to drive because she couldn't fly. The world was spinning. It was terrible. Okay. She was basically carried into that clinic that day. By Wednesday, she was walking on her own. Actually, she ran in from the car to the hotel as it rained on her head. This began her journey of getting much, much better as time went on. This wasn't like everything was cured in a week there. But she went from being supported, the world spending, everything being all out of whack that she saw, to being able to walk. So midway through that week, you know, they go, hey, guess what? All right. So at this point, I'm going to tell you, this wasn't just a patient, because this is my darling wife. 
that I got to deal with, right? So for 14 weeks, she was in bed, except to use the bathroom or to go to a doctor's appointment. Halfway through that week, this doctor we saw just stopped me in the hall with his nice little, I call it my burning bush, said, just so you know, you're being lazy. <laughs> There's no reason that someone has to drive a thousand miles to get this type of care. So quit being lazy, get moving, get to learning. And that's how it happened. So there, without further ado, that's kind of what goes on. So that's how a chiropractor gets involved in the work of the brain because his wife's brain goes crazy after a kidney infection, right? So away we go with that. So I'm here to talk to you about your memory. Every one of us has to worry about it. Everybody's conscious of it. What I find in my life and my practice is some people worry way too much about it. Some people don't worry enough about it. All right, and so you get people coming in when things have kind of really, really gone south and there's only so much you can do. You get other people that are, I forgot where my car keys were this morning for the first time in 78 years. I must be having a stroke. Okay, so it's it's probably not the case there either. Yeah, so before we kind of dive into memory, mm -hmm. the, this doctor you saw in the Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, Dr. Carrick, can you explain just a, it, it, a little bit more about what functional neurology is and, and why that interfaces with chiropractic and, and how how is what he does different than what a medical neurologist does? Because I think understanding this will help frame sure. why this the brain is so, what we're going to talk about with the brain. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in the world of functional neurology or chiropractic neurology versus medical neurology, a lot of the training is very similar. A lot of the tests are very similar. I always tell anybody in the medical world, you're always looking for pathology. Is there a tumor there? Is there a stroke there? Is there something growing that shouldn't be there? Is something degenerating that shouldn't show up? In our world of functional neurology, we're looking at function, right? So we have many, many patients that have no pathological lesion, right? Pass every test. They come into our office going, I still don't feel right. My memory slipping. I'm not as sharp as I used to be. And I always look back to uh, a lot of our information comes from the world of concussion. And we had a lady that um, basically she was a NCAA hockey player. And there's cognitive scores that they use to put people back into play with um, concussion. And so she scored in the 97th percentile. So everybody's like, your concussion's healed. You're ready to play. You're ready to play. She's like, I don't feel right still. Okay? Well, what it turns out that this lady, when this lady's concussed, she still operates better than 97% of us. Okay? When she's not concussed, she sets the bar. So in her world, that was greatly different for her, but she could pass every test a person could put in front of her. So that's some of the things we look at in the functional world. What isn't quite working the way you want it to? And is there anything we can do about it? Yeah, I always I always tell patients when I when I talk about Dr. Hubbard, I always say I would put his knowledge of pathways, neural pathways in the brain, probably above any other medical neurologist that's out there. He probably understands the inner workings of the brain a whole lot more than than a, than a lot of um, even medical doctors do. So, uh, but as far as this conversation about memory, can you talk talk a little bit about what what is memory? Like, is there a certain part of the brain that does memory? Is it a lot of different parts? I mean, what exactly is memory? Okay. Well, the first thing I do is I want to dispel the biggest myth there is about the brain, and that is that we only use 10% of it, and that 90% of it sits there idle. Guess what? In this world of life, if 90% of our brain sat idle over thousands of years, we wouldn't have it. All right? It works constantly. This organ within between our ears that compromises on the most part of us, 3% of our body weight, uses 20% of our energy. Okay? So this thing is working all the time. So memory is not a specific spot. And it turns out to be a lot of times in some classical tests that we have of people who either from surgery or from traumatic events lost areas of their brain. And this has shown very specific deficits in memory. So we go, oh, well, this memory is in the hippocampus. This memory is over here in this temporal lobe. This is up here in the frontal lobe. What we really find in today's world is that the whole brain's involved in it, okay? And there's certain portions of memory that matter, okay? The very first part of memory is our sensory memory, all right? If someone asks you, gives you a list to remember, I want you to remember these five numbers, seven, three, six, nine, one. 
If you can't hear those, it doesn't matter what they said. Or if you heard alligator, Buddha, tree, you're going to repeat back alligator, Buddha, tree. It's not a problem within your memory of your brain. It's the ability to hear it. The other thing is how your eyes perceive your world. Make sure that I'm on the edge of the stage, not falling off of it. All right? So if you are constantly, like my wife, trying to figure out your world around you, your brain has no capacity to remember anything because it's just trying to be safe. All right? So it ends up in different little areas of the brain. The sensory portions first, and then it hits short-term memory. How many of you remember those five numbers? Yeah, almost. <laughs> okay. One, I didn't ask you to do it. I just said five numbers. That's how long our short-term memory is meant to last. Moments. So if we don't do anything to reinforce it, we're not going to remember it. Huh? <laughs> there you go. Yay. All right. So we go through it, and we use little tricks to put it into what we call working memory. And working memory is probably what we talk about the most within people. And this is the, I walked into my kitchen, I knew I was going to do something. Don't remember what that was. Okay? Or, get on the phone with my wife on the way home. Can you pick up some water and some milk and some apples on the way home? Okay? If that's the one time she says it and I'm thinking about something completely different, I'm not going to remember any of that. So if I don't write it down on the list or do something to reinforce it, I'm not going to remember it. I'm going to get home. She's like, hey. And I'm like, yay, I get to go back. <laughs> All right. And this gets into we have to be able to pay attention to what someone is saying to us. Okay. So then we get into our long term memories. These are memories that have to mean something to us. All right. And we start to put an emotional component to it. And I've got a good friend of mine that always talks about the first time he smells grass cut every summer, it reminds him of his dad, because this is something they did together since they were little kids. They mowed the lawn together, all right? So it's not that the grass has anything to do with his dad, but as soon as he smells that, these memories of him come back within his head, all right? So these are very, very long-term memories. They are usually the last to disappear without absolute trauma of things. Does that kind of answer? Yeah, answer yeah, absolutely. So are there certain areas of the brain that the short-term versus long-term are stored in, or what actual parts of the brain are involved in memory? Okay, so the, the classical studies of short-term memory talk about the hippocampus, okay? And this is an area really deep within our brain that's very close to our emotional areas of our brain, all right? Our working memory kind of happens out in broader areas of our brain called our cortex, okay? And that's really a network of things more than it is one little area. So I see something and I want to remember that that phone's blue. Okay, That's a whole network between an area of our brain called our occipital lobe on up to a prefrontal cortex. So you can remember it. And then it just gets stored deep, 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 deep. Those memories like the cutting grass are deep within the brain. So for, for people who have certain specific types of um, you know, dementia or Alzheimer's, I mean, those obviously affect very specific parts of the brain. And mm -hmm. so how does that kind of connect in with some of the memory issues that people, sure. people experience? Okay. So in a lot of those, it's yeah. that short-term to working memory areas, okay? And these are areas in a portion of our brain called our frontal lobe, more specifically called a prefrontal cortex, all right? So these are big doctor words for areas of your brain, okay? So, um, Unfortunately, in some of those disease processes, that's where it starts to degenerate. Okay? And so it becomes harder and harder and harder to do. But what we do know in today's world that we didn't know even a short 20 years ago is that our brain's plastic and it's ever-changing. Right? So even when something gets damaged, if we're lucky enough, we can teach other areas of the brain to pick up that same task and then do those same types of things. So it's kind of like thinking of the brain a little bit like a muscle. If you strain a muscle and you get put in a cast or you break an arm, you get put in a cast, the muscle wastes away a little bit. But we can quickly recover it by doing exercises. And you can do some of the same stuff with brain exercises. Some of them that we've developed early on really found a way to make us experts at the games more so than translate into things. So you became an expert Sudoku player or you became an expert crossword puzzle doer. You know but it wasn't so much transmitted to it globally.
so this is why, <clears throat> excuse me, for instance, people who have a stroke, that a stroke damages, kills certain neurons, they can regain a lot of that function mm -hmm. because the brain can make new connections. Right. So can you explain a little bit about the connections and the network of connections and how does that work and how do we make connections? Like what okay. can we do to make those connections? Yeah. So a lot of every neurologic exam is really trying to find out what's working and what's not after an event such as a stroke. Okay, so if an area of the brain gets damaged, okay, and it's absolutely, there's zero function of it whatsoever, you go and you do this exam and sometimes you find out the bridge is out and it's not gonna work. But sometimes you can look around and go, hey, if I exit at exit 38, I can get around there and I still end up in the same spot. It might take me an extra couple minutes to get there, but that's how we start developing new pathways through that. And if anybody's ever lived no, near a detour place or some type of road construction, you know, the detour starts to wear. The, and it becomes more efficient. And as you go, and maybe you live there and you've taken this exit detour for six months, a year, 18 months, depending on the construction project, then the road opens. You know how many of us continue on the detour <laughs> well after the road opens? Because that's become our efficient path home. Even though now that that bridge is fixed, it's quicker to get there, but it's just kind of how the brain works. We just re-energize, remake connections, make these areas that maybe once didn't do this, do something it didn't plan to do. How do we make those connections? Like what is it, is it, is it physical movements? Is it brain exercises or what can people do to, to make, or is it a lot of it just, well, we answer, just do it? It's the answer to that is yes. yes. <laughs> um, it, it is all of the above. Some of it's cognitive exercises. Some of it's spending some time reading. Some of it's spending time exercising. I think as we move forward, we're finding a whole lot more our basic exercises, our best way to prevent memory loss. It's our best way to prevent some of this, what we call neurocognitive decline. Um, so far, we don't have a pill, potion, or lotion that will fix this at this point. But the more we find people exercise, whatever that is for them. Some people it's riding a bike, some people it's walking, some people it's running. Their brain kind of sprouts out and builds more connections. As a matter of fact, we think at this point all this wonderful thought and empathy and wonderful skills that we do as human beings really sprouted out from our ability to move. We weren't really put here to have these wonderful emotions that we love. But as we began to move more and more and more and work fine with our hands, away it went. So we found these things out, like with, um, if you take certain images of, say, a violin player, you're going to find the area of their brain that represents their left hand, assuming they play this way, right, and not this way, all right, has much more connections, much more density, and works more efficiently than other areas of their brain, of their brain, but even way more so than we do ourselves, right? And so the rest of us that didn't grow up playing this violin don't have those pathways built. So sometimes in rehab or stroke type of rehab or any type of brain-based rehab, you can find things that don't seem to have anything to do with what that person has a problem with. And you teach them to do that, right? So teach them to play a violin. If anybody's been around someone learning to play a violin, I'd pick another instrument. You know, it's absolutely beautiful when it works right, but good grief, someone learning, it's pretty tough, okay? But they, these are things. So if we find an area of your brain that we need to increase representation of your hand for, for instance. If we can put you on a task that repeatedly does that, the brain lays down those new connections. I mean, how many people have ever learned something new? Or the other thing of how many of you have really forgot how to ride a bike, right? For most of us, this is something we learned in our youth. We can put you on a bike today and you can still do it assuming you've got the physical abilities, right? And these are from constant repetition and practice. So the problem with that is learning something new is way harder than doing things we're already good at, correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. so, but I, from what I, from what I'm understanding uh -huh. is doing the things that are the hardest for us is the most important when it comes to developing new connections in the brain and kind of rewiring. Re yes, it can be, or it can be doing things that we've done before that we no longer can do because of the injury and maybe doing them in a little bit of a modified manner until you can get them back to those things. So it doesn't have to always be new. New works the best because it does.
Mm-hmm. So, I, so one thing maybe I think that is concerning for a lot of mm-hmm. people is is understanding that fine line between, you know, what is just you know forgetting a few simple tasks, a few simple things versus when do things, when does this become an issue? When does memory become an issue? And when is it a sign of cognitive decline? And mm-hmm. the, this, the second question to that is, what are some of the other signs and symptoms? Like, are there physical things that people should be concerned about? If posture's changing or movement's changing, what are some of the other physical symptoms that could also indicate mm-hmm. neurodegenerative decline apart from just memory? Okay. Yeah, well, memory is one we all think about um, because it's so prevalent in our appreciation of the world. What I do find that really disappears way earlier than memory in most people that are kind of going down this route are the ability to smell. Even more so than smell, it's really the taste of food. Because not many people can go, hmm, I'm not smelling as well as I used to. But a lot of our appreciation of how food tastes comes from our ability to smell. So all of a sudden, your spouse's favorite foods, they no longer like them, or they don't care about them so much. This is one of the early signs of it. Another thing is just physically slowing down in movement. I feel like I'm having to slow down for my spouse to walk with me. I don't get to places as quickly as I once did. Now, that all assumes nothing else has gone wrong, you know, like you completely have a degenerated knee that needs replaced and that's what's slowing you down, or a hip that's completely torn apart, and that's why you're slowing down, all right? Posture changes are big. The ability to balance is huge, okay? As a matter of fact, one of the greatest predictors of memory problems and dementia is the ability to stand on one foot for 30 seconds, okay? People think I'm nuts when I do it because it's that hard for some people to do, all right? So I'd tell you to stand up and do this, but I don't know what anybody's health history is like, so let's not do that. Uh, Make sure you have a chair, because if you can't do it standing up on a chair, you surely can't do it standing up on your own. And then the next thing is, can you do it with your eyes closed? So these are things that show up in people much earlier than, wow, I'm forgetting everything. Now, as far as when is it a problem, the reality of that answer is when it becomes a problem for you or you're the people around you, right? I had people with severe memory loss that it really didn't matter to them or their loved one. It's kind of, that's what it did. As long as they knew who they were, knew people around, could appreciate them being around, that was really all they needed within life. I've had other people where, wow, I forgot my keys for the first time in my life, and they're like, something's going wrong, okay? So it really is when it becomes a problem for you. Or the other way I would say it, is if you're thinking about your memory, you may need to do something about it. So is it, is it beyond the scope of this lecture to talk about why some of those, I mean, wh- why is it that, you know, you, you know, balance is an issue and why mm-hmm. is it that smell is an issue? How does that in any way connect with memory and, and degenerative, is, is it beyond the scope to talk a little bit about that? I'll talk about anything anybody wants to hear. <laughs> it is kind of how it works for me. I'll go on any route. So if anybody has a question, they can ask that too. Well, part of it is back to perceiving where you are in space. Okay. My feeling is this is your brain's most important job it has, and it takes this above all others. If your brain does not know where you are and doesn't know anything about your environment, you have no chance of remembering or learning anything because it's too busy using all of that energy standing up or sitting down or watching those things go on. So these are things that we find happens early on in people as they start to lose their balance or they lose their coordination. These are early signs of brain degeneration. You know, most of us have seen an episode of Cops or something along those lines where people have been pulled over and you see them do these Saturday night drunk tests and walk a straight line, say ABCs backwards and forwards, these types of deals. Some of the tests we do in our office are very, very similar. Why? Because alcohol affects these areas of the brain. It slows them down. Sometimes when neurodegeneration happens, it's just our life that have caused these same problems. So does that kind of answer that a little bit? Yeah, okay. absolutely. So, so if somebody is saying, okay, this sounds like me. I'm having a few of these issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, what should they do? I mean, what are sure. kind of some of the first steps to look at? Well, first and foremost is consult with your own doctor, right? And this I forgot to say at the beginning of this whole thing 
is anything I have to say today is like a 30,000 foot view of this problem. It has nothing to do specifically with you. All right, and so I've opened this up to ask questions and understand that if you ask a question, we're in a public forum and this is being streamed online so you have no expectations of privacy, right? So, <laughs> so that's the other thing along those lines. But what, um, now I lost my train of thought. So wh where should people start? What should they start looking okay. at? <laughs> Stress also affects the yes. memory, right? Yes, yes, yes. So what should people start looking at? Like medications? Oh, are yeah, there yeah, certain okay. dietary yeah, yeah. things? I mean, are, so there, the very first are there certain thing, things yeah. that could, no matter if you're doing everything right, mm -hmm. still could have an effect on your yeah. brain? All right, so that's what I would tell anybody that thinks they're having any bit of problem along these lines, is the first stop is with your own family doctor. Someone that knows your health history, someone that knows what's going on. As you can see from the little sheet I gave there, there's 10 classes of medication that are known to affect memory, okay? And now this doesn't mean if you're on one of those, quit taking them, okay? Because the effect of the medication could be much greater for you than not having it. And this is why you've got to stop and talk with your doctor. Because the other thing that happens is a prescription gets given to someone eight, ten years ago. And we assume it's being effective as doctors because no one's asking us about it. And there's maybe something newer on the market or something better on the market or something that won't affect you in these ways. And as doctors, we don't know what side effects you're having unless you let us know. And we don't have these wonderful crystal balls that get to come in and sit down and go, oh, we know everything's going on with you. So you got to have that talk with them. And the other thing I would say is you got to be very honest with yourself because this is something I find patients hide as much as they possibly can from everybody around them is that I'm starting to struggle with my memory. Because as soon as you start struggling with your memory, it's this big warning sign of I'm going to lose my autonomy. I'm not going to be able to stay in my home. I'm not going to be able to do this. People are going to come in and start doing things for me that I really don't want around. And so they'll push it off and they'll ignore it and they won't have that talk. So, and this also goes, there are some wonderful supplements in the world that have done some wonderful things for us. Those aren't always completely safe, all right? So there's a few classes of those, mostly that are meant to relax muscles, help you sleep, those types of things. They can affect memory greatly as well. So you gotta make sure that nothing you're taking is the problem with the memory, all right? Because if we can simply eliminate that or put you on something different then that's great. We can have the same therapeutic effects and not the side effects that you have. And that's the first place. The other thing is you got to keep your blood pressure in check. A great trending thing within the United States right now is blood sugar problems, not just those that are diabetic, those that fall in this line of pre-diabetes. High constant blood sugar is huge stress on neurons. They don't work as well when we have that going on. And the other thing I tell anybody out there with diabetes is it's not just keeping your numbers down. Well, that's a marker we use to make sure you're keeping it under control. If your blood sugar is still spiking and crashing, spiking and crashing, spiking and crashing all day long, you're putting yourself at risk for these memory problems. Okay. Um, can you talk, you said blood, blood pressure issues, diabetes. Mm -hmm. Are there any other chronic diseases you would say put you at risk for... Brain-based sure. disorders, can yeah. you talk a little bit about yeah. a few more? Any heart disease does. Um, any high homocysteine levels do. It just damages internal blood vessels. Our brain, like we said earlier, uses 20% of our energy because all this wonderful blood's going up there. All right, and the stroke's one of our most terrible events a person can possibly have. All right, so those are some big ones. Other things are sedentary life, um, eating terribly. These are just all huge, huge portions of the put you. So, so speaking of, of movement, what mm -hmm. is some of the best types of movement for the brain? Like, okay. so what sort of exercises do you recommend? I mean, sure. of course, it depends on the person and their, mm -hmm. their mobility, but what are some of the best things that people can do? My first thing is always get outside and walk, okay? There's something magical and wonderful with watching the world go by and spending a whole lot of our time on one foot. So as we take a walk, we're on one foot for about 70% of the time we're moving, okay? Being outside and walking is different than hitting the treadmill. You are propelling your own weight. You are experiencing the world going by, and these are things that kind of help with this a whole lot more. The other exercise thing that's been shown over and over again to help stave off some of this is Tai Chi. 
if you're watching someone do it. It's patterning their slow controlled movements that seem to be the benefit of Tai Chi over other exercises. The biggest thing I would say though is that those things are not possible for you anything. I don't care if it's sitting in your recliner because you've had crazy amounts of back surgery, total pain in your legs, your legs don't work. Just moving. Move, 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 move. Use your hands to fiddle with something. Find a hobby that knitting, crocheting, manipulating things with your hands. It's a huge, huge thing. It's movement, 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 movement. So speaking of, of you had mentioned earlier Sudoku, do, are there any brain games to help? Like any of those apps? Any yeah. Of, I mean, does, yeah. That, does that help? Or is that, like you said, just making us really good at Sudoku, <laughs> you know, or the specific game? Well, we don't quite know yet because um, this is too early in the history of life. Okay. We've got another 20 years. Okay. So what I would tell anybody with these brain games is they're probably better than not doing them. Okay, you are using areas of the brain. These things aren't just made up out of thin air. There is some neuroscience behind them, but what we don't know yet is if they answer that question. We know we can make you better at working memory if we use that task as the benchmark. All right, so if we go back to our tell me five numbers in a row, if we work on that, 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 and I see you again in six months, and you can do that very well, have we really improved your working memory or have we improved your ability to do that task? We've probably improved your ability to do that task, but it's probably better for you than not. Right? So in our world of technology today, we no longer memorize phone numbers. We no longer do a lot of things along those lines. And it's like, I have patients every day that would fall in the lines of normal cognition. And if you ask them their spouse's number, they'll say, I don't know, <laughs> because they never use it. They put it in their phone one time, right? So that doesn't mean that these cell phones are absolutely terrible for our memory, but they are something we no longer do. We also don't spend as much time reading as we once did. So those types of things, exercising our ability to understand. If reading's not a task that you like to do, there's wonderful things out there on the internet in the world of TED Talks and just information that you can listen to and process and learn about something that you enjoy is a, a very, very big task. Find something that you're interested in. Like my father, it's fishing. For me, it's not. But if you sat there and you were to watch over and over some new techniques about fishing, learning something new, learning something along those lines, it's a positive thing for him. right? And it's more likely that he will do it than sitting him in front of a neurology lecture. Okay, well, it's neat because my son's doing it. <laughs> it gets pretty boring real, real fast. So one thing I, I feel like I talk to patients a lot mm -hmm. about is the impact of stress on their mm -hmm. health. And I mean, we talk about the impact of stress on blood sugar, the impact of stress on sleep and all these things. But one other thing that I, I think people don't realize is how much stress affects our ability to remember. And, and the analogy I always use is, you know, if you were, you know, one of our ancestors in the woods and you were getting attacked by a bear, there's no reason to commit any information to long-term memory because your brain doesn't know if you're right. going to be around in five minutes or not. And so, you know, we live in a world where not only do we, you know, do we, you know, release a lot of these stress hormones easily, but because we're not exercising, because we have desk jobs, because we're driving everywhere, when we do release these stress hormones, they just kind of sit there and our, our bodies aren't real efficient at clearing out those hormones. And so can you talk a little bit more about how Absolutely. stress affects our brain and memory? Because I feel like that's a big one. It's a huge one. Right? <laughs> for a lot of us. It's a huge one for all of us. So the first thing I would tell anybody, all right, so we're going to use your bear example, but we're going to use it a little bit more into modern times. If we were all to go through this door over here and there were a stuffed bear, surprisingly, not like a teddy bear, but like a taxidermy bear in the hallway, we would all get surprised. Our brain's reaction would be identical to as if it were really a bear there. It has no ability to know the difference when the stress reaction starts to happen until our mind kicks in and goes, huh, okay, someone donated a neat thing for us to decorate the hall with, okay? This We're not looking for any taxidermy yeah, no, bears, no, by the way, in the hallway. <laughs> So, and the other thing is the brain knows no difference between that bear and a deadline. 
until you start to tell it different, right? And so when this stress reaction starts to happen, our brain has three modes, fight, flight, or freeze. Okay, I'm going to beat the bear up, I'm going to run from the bear, or I'm going to stand really still and hope it eats someone else. Okay, same thing with the deadline that's causing the stress within our life. I'm going to fight the deadline, I'm going to get through it, I'm going to put behind it, I'm going to prepare. I'm going to run from it, I'm just not going to show up for this lecture, right? Or I'm going to freeze up here and forget my train of thought, right? It can happen in any of those types of things. So that's the stress side of things at that point. So anytime that system is running, you have no need to commit anything to memory, not even long term. You don't need to know anything about anything. It's not the time to solve a boardroom problem, okay? So how many of us in our jobs are under constant, constant stress, and we're asking us to remember a task we're supposed to do? We don't get it done. That causes more stress. Stress at home. These things are constantly running, and in that time, our brain has no capacity to remember or learn. It's not the time to solve complex calculus. It's the time to make sure I'm okay and I'm safe. Okay? So then the other downside to this chronic stress that happens is this wonderful hormone cortisol likes to attack this wonderful area of our brain called the hippocampus. If you remember it from earlier, it's where we start this short-term working memory stuff. Okay? So it might destroy some of it. We do know it prevents it from working super well. And there's some new research that's saying this is an area of the brain that can actually develop new neurons. But if there's cortisol around, it can't. So this is how it affects it, right? And so when we're constantly running in that fight or flight or freeze mode within our life, our memory's not gonna work so well, right? And I hope you can't solve complex calculus when a bear is in the hallway, okay? Because, hey, you don't need to, right? And the other thing is, is we don't have enough blood running through our system to do all these things at once. So, so kind of taking this a few levels deeper mm -hmm. um, and going off script here, so no, that's fine. hopefully this is okay. So the way the brain processes stress, from what I'm understanding, mm -hmm. is you know it's it's it, it the the bear the stuffed bear is an experience that we have and we learn you know in some ways how to respond you know mm -hmm. to that stress. So what about the opposite of when we've had experiences in our life where we've learned to kind of upregulate that stress response mm -hmm. in connection with maybe things that shouldn't be stressful? Like I have a two year old that somewhere along the way he has decided that flies are the most awful thing in the world. He will come face to face with an 80 pound dog and pet its head, but a fly shoots him into orbit. And somewhere along the way he learned that. And so if we have some of those stress patterns, is there a way to unlearn that? Or is there, I mean, can you talk a little bit about how that yeah, affects yeah, the brain there, there's, emotionally? Yeah, there's cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to change that, right? And it's almost, in a gross explanation of it with this two-year-old, putting him in a room this size, on that end of the building, putting a fly in a jar that it can't get out, okay? And then they get to learn that, okay, that fly can't do whatever that child thinks it's going to do because it's captured. And then you go from up here on stage, you leave the child where it's at, and you move it to another table, move it to another table. You get it closer and closer and closer until they get to realize that that thing is not a threat. And so, yes, you can unlearn some of these stress reactions that we have through repetitive exposure to the stressors under phobia, things like that. But there's also just finding ways to calm down and relax. So part of the thing is always, you see in those 10 tips, it's finding time for quiet, right? We use prayer and or meditation. But I'll tell anybody, Shut the TV off, shut the phone off, shut the light off, sit down for 10 minutes. And what's going to be amazing to everybody that doesn't do it is how long 10 minutes is <laughs> when you're not doing anything because we're so used to clicking away, go, 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 go in our lives. And this is a place where that system just gets a chance to downregulate and be, whew, all right? Is that... Yeah, yeah that. absolutely. So kind of in that same vein, how does sleep affect the, not only the brain, but specifically how does sleep affect our ability to make and recall memories? Yeah. So one thing I would tell anybody, sleep is not just something to reserve for the end of a long day of work. A good day and I can sleep. Short sleep cycles also don't put us through enough of our sleep cycles to allow our brain to make these connections that make memories long-term. 
So sleep is not just a place for your body to rest. This is actually where your brain starts to diversify and put things in places that it can so it can call, recall it for memory at another time. And this happens unconsciously at night. But you know what? It's like, once again, even while you're sleeping, 20% of that energy burn is being done within our brain. It's being, it's constantly working to get you ready for your next day. And that's where the memories really happen. So it's not just, hey, let your body recover. Okay, so tough question mm -hmm. here. Is there ever a point of no return? Is there ever a point where it is too late, things are too far gone, you can't make you know, a positive impact? Or is there always hope as far as the brain goes to you know, be moving in a positive direction as far as neural connections go? In, in my mind, it's a funeral. Okay, that's when there's no more hope for it, right? That's done. The problem really becomes graded expectations, right? Can we take someone with severe late stage Alzheimer's and make them our national spelling bee champion again? No. So you really gotta define within a person what's important to them, what is this causing a problem for, and then you gotta decide is this something we can do? And then two, is it worth the effort, right? So if, let's say, I'm gonna use something other than memory, but let's say someone can walk 10 steps, okay? But something's 11 steps away from them in their life that they need to do. But it's gonna take 400 hours of physical therapy to go from step 10 to 11. You've gotta decide is that step 11, does that mean I get to the bathroom on time? and I don't have to deal with those issues, it might be worth it to you. Is step 11 meaning I can get to my deck, but you know I could probably take a wheelchair out there or use a walker to get there as well. So it's a convoluted answer, but that's really the truth. No matter what, there is probably something someone can do about it, but you've got to decide is the effort worth the result. So somebody who's kind of in a gray area, what is, going to make the biggest impact the quickest as far as regaining some of this neural function? Is it a supplement? Is it an exercise? Is it a combination of all those different things? Is it seeing you as a patient? What is going to be the best way to quickly? Mm -hmm. Well, humbly, I have a little bias about what I can do, right? No, <laughs> but the, the reality is there, one is addressing the issue straight ahead and honestly, I think is the biggest thing anybody can do if they're sitting in that gray area. You know, and this is something that is a problem. I need to do something about it. And then it starts that cycle of doctor, make sure there's nothing you're taking. Make sure there's nothing that's happened disease process. I mean, thyroid issues, diabetes you didn't know happened. There are so many diseases that can affect our memory that are completely treatable. And if we bring these things back in order, wow, it all returns. And that's, that's kind of where we came from with these uh, concussion things that we treated these other problems with patients and their memories improved. There are things along those lines. The brain got a chance to work a little bit better. But if your hormone system's way out of whack, males and females, this brain doesn't work as well as it once did. So if you can find that, so it's, it's facing it head on, understanding that you're having the problem and putting a plan together that works within your ability to afford and do, right? Because that's the other thing is you don't want your healthcare to become this great stress burden that keeps your memory from working as well. Is that okay for yeah, I was going to say, I, I've got more questions, but I, I think at this point, let's go ahead and open it up and let's mm -hmm. see if, if anybody else has any questions for Dr. Hubbard. We can go ahead and address a few of those, and then if not, I've got a whole mm -hmm. whole list of other ones. Yeah. Yes, Jake. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, this is a good video. I stopped that uh, Netflix video that you said. Mm-hmm. So the question for our, our online audience is going back to the comment that Dr. Hubbard made that one of the first early signs is your sense of smell starting to go. And so the question is, can you explain a little bit more about why that is? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Okay. 
Well, one, the nerves in our nose that smell are direct outpouchings of our brain. It doesn't even go through a processing center. Okay, so that's one reason as the brain kind of goes in a way we don't want it to, that smell becomes a big issue. But the truth to, truthful answer to your question is I don't know because it could be a whole list of everything, right? So I could have someone that had a head injury, for instance, hit their head on a cabinet door. For some reason that sheared off these nerves within their nose and they don't work. And it has nothing to do with their ability to remember or anything along those lines. It was a traumatic injury. We can have something in your nose that people don't even know. But when it comes to what I was alluding to, it's really because this nerve is a direct outpouching of the brain. So the question is, when you're trying to figure out where you're going, it's, you know, used to be certain things that were automatic now require a little bit more thought and, you know, it's. So, you know, we dismiss a lot of things as age that really have nothing to do with age. All right. As I tell anybody, probably 20 years ago in this world of healthcare of mine, the thing that surprised me most is one of the statistics that still boggles my mind is half of people over the age of 60 who are in daily pain have yet to tell any healthcare provider about the pain they're in. Okay, because they just assume I hit 60, I hurt. Okay, so we assume I hit 80, I'm going to have some problems with this memory. And some of that's a little bit true. It doesn't work as fast and as quick as it once did. Okay, and recovering from those things don't recover quite as fast as maybe someone, you know, in their 30s. But it's really working on where are you, finding out is there something going on that is... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the answer to that is, you know, trying to figure out what it is. And it goes back to that same cycle of things, you know, it really address... Hey, you bet. Do we have any other questions? I think we're at one way in the back. Yes. So the question was that she's heard that the gut is the second brain, mm -hmm. and um, so how 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 is that, and how does how does the gut affect the brain? Got another couple hours. <laughs> No, 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 in all truthfulness, right? Um, yes, it's been known as a second brain. Um, my bias is the brain affects the gut more than the gut affects the brain, but this is my own personal, you know, thing. Um, so a few things, right? We talk about that stress reaction that's going on constantly within our lives. It's also, if there's a bear in the room, you have no need to digest anything at that point, okay? So if we're under this constant fight, flight, fight, or freeze, reaction within our life, our gut's not going to work at all, okay? Because it's not time to digest. We're still thinking we're not safe. The other thing is, is some of the neuro, some of the chemicals within our brain that allow our brain to work and our gut work to work are similar. And so, yes, they end up being there. And yes, there's a very direct correlation between the two. And I find people that have gut issues oftentimes have brain issues. I find people with brain issues oftentimes have gut issues. And then you've just got to decide within your healthcare community and things that you're doing how to address those things, right? I get to see a lot of people that tried some of these gut things and didn't have health. Why? Because it's all over the news. It's everywhere you turn. People hear about that much more so than, hey, the brain causes the gut problem. Does that answer your question or did I just run around it in circles? Okay. Do we have any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Could it be that um, maybe just through societal development or something, your brain just shifts into an automatic mode? Um, and then it, there comes a time where it just it realizes that, no, it needs to be re-taught, such, such as maybe 
you know, losing the ability to spell, uh, you know, where you used to be a really good speller mm -hmm. back in grade school or something like mm -hmm. that. Could it just be like we we rely so much on the, uh, you know, the, the automatic process of doing things and then there comes a time later in life where your brain is like, no, you, you, you need a retraining. It, it, is well, that yeah, it can be, right? You know, so the reality I would tell anybody is when's the last time you tried to spell things? Yeah. You know, we just don't. Um, and, you know, the other thing I have people come in, it's like, I used to remember people's names and faces like that, and I'm not doing it anymore. I went to my high school reunion, and I didn't remember anybody. Well, guess what? This memory within your brain that you have of those people is 50 years old. <laughs> Okay, they weren't the same people. They don't look the same. They don't act the same. Maybe the name's the same. Maybe the name's not even the same, right? You know, and so that gets to be some of it too, is we're overcritical of some of these things that are just a natural process. And there's nothing wrong with your ability to learn to spell better. You just haven't tried to do it. So does that yeah. make sense? So yeah. pretty much what, what needs to be is what you should pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so like, I mean, if your job has, I don't need to learn how to use a hammer real well in the work that I do, okay? I'm not overly skilled with a hammer, <laughs> all right? But, and I'm not going to spend a lot of my time learning to increase those skills with a hammer. Um, this is just not something I'm doing, right? So it really, it does matter with what is important to you. Um, and that's back to the being honest about it all. Mm -hmm. Yes. Some of us, I for one have been on a relatively uh, regimented uh, prescription drugs for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Grade PD, four years, four mm -hmm. years of hormone replacement, uh, simvastatin for cholesterol. All mm -hmm. of these not on a very high doses, but over a long period of time. Prozac. Mm -hmm. And then two years ago, I had back surgery, a hip replacement, two hip replacements, and I had mm -hmm. three heavy doses of gabapentin. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, memory that has always been very good starts to be a little bit bothered. Mm -hmm. Is it, is there a cumulative effect on some of these things? Because I took myself off the project, I took myself off the city statin, but even here at the clinic, I'm still recommended to have some hormone replacement, and um, I don't take gabapentin anymore either. So is there a cumulative effect? Yeah, so the, the question was, if, if you've been on even low doses of medication for a long period of time, is there a cumulative effect to taking some of those medications? And I would, I would especially highlight in that some of, the, um, some of the psychotropic medications people are put on, antidepressants, you know, things that people are put on for a long period of time that are, you know, seemingly benign. Can this have an effect? And if so, can it be a very sudden change in, 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 in memory, even though being on those medications for a long time? Yes is the answer. There is a cumulative effect. The other thing I'm going to say is there is a terrible effect in not treating some of these things. So undiagnosed and untreated depression, your brain doesn't remember then either. Okay. There's so this is why every bit of it is a balancing act in finding out what's most important. That's one thing I wanted to say is I give you that list of drugs. It doesn't mean go get off them if you are having memory issues because the effect of them could be much more important for you than some of these memory issues and getting off them might not solve it at all. Mm -hmm. All right, But yes, the longer you're on something, there's a much more likelihood that your body becomes dependent on having that around and therefore it gets to be harder when you go off of it or it just, you know. There really seems to be a dependency with you, but the memory issue has raised its head. Mm -hmm. And so the answer to the question is yes, there is a cumulative effect of multiple things with that. But I would say there's a higher probability not treating some of these things would have shown up much earlier on in life as well. Is that fair in an answer? Or? Okay. I'll accept it. <laughs> the question is can you detoxify from the drugs you've been on if you've been on them for a while? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's not my area of expertise it's in all truthfulness with this detoxification thing. There are probably people around here that do a lot better job of knowing that than I do. Okay. Um, but yes, you can typically get off of anything and start a new place in life and build up from there. So I would say in his situation is if we get, if he's off all of these things that could have been causing the problem and we're still having the issues, we probably need to do something more about it. It wasn't just the medications he was on. Mm -hmm. Can you inherit a bad memory? Can you inherit a bad memory? Great question. I was thinking the same question. If you didn't ask it, I was going to. Well, yes. You know, gen genetics do play a role in all of this. But I do feel for the most part, we can overcome most of our genetic dispositions. So if you inherited a bad memory, you might have to work a little hard, harder than someone else to remember something. Happily, because mom and dad, I think I inherited a pretty darn good one. I didn't have to work as hard as some in memorizing some of these facts and figures that we had to do throughout life and through school. Right? So I had a little easier path than someone that didn't. But yeah, absolutely, your genetic plays, plays a role in that. Mm -hmm. So the, the question the question was a traumatic brain injury that was a number of years ago that affected memory. Is there anything you could do years later to regain some of that? What we found is yes, it is the truth with that. Um, a lot of it is back to some of these things we talked about before. If your brain doesn't know where you're going, doesn't know where you are in space, doesn't know it really is under a lot of stress just by being alive, and it doesn't really have a capacity to then do memory because it's really more concerned about am I going to fall with that next step. Our brain is very pre-programmed towards safety of ourselves above all. And it will let you hurt. It will make funny postures. It'll make you sit when you want to walk um, just to make sure that you are safe. So, it, so does that answer that? Mm -hmm. Well, there are things, right? And some, like from the 30,000 foot view that I've talked about from this, right? You know, it does get into exercising, e eating better for yourself, right? Making sure none of these health problems are along the lines. Because this is the other thing I find with things like traumatic brain injury or a, any other diagnosis of a disease that can have a syndrome involved with it is people tend to go, well, that's just that and then they don't seek out the problem. And then you find out, yeah, you had a traumatic brain injury five years ago, but a lot of your problem right now is your thyroid's out of control, okay? Or you're dealing with a depression or an anxiety issue, and these are all things that need to be addressed instead of just going, I had a traumatic brain injury, making sure what you're experiencing now has nothing to do with something new is another big, big, big key. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, what sort of testing does Dr. Hubbard do? Mm -hmm. This is really cool. All right, so we do a lot of work with the, a neurologic exam that most people have maybe been experienced or maybe have not. The other things that we do, we do a lot of work with person's balance, their ability to stand in place. We do some objective measuring. It's called computerized dynamic posturography, okay? Which means I got a computer that decides whether you can stand up or not. All right, under different challenges. One would be with your eyes open, one would be with your eyes closed, and then we put you on a foam pad, which kind of tricks your brain about where you are in space, and can you compensate with that? And so that's some of the testing we use. We also use what's called video oculography, okay, which is a wonderful little camera that measures your eyes and how they move to known targets. And are you, is your reaction time up to what it should be? Do you get to where you're supposed to be? It, it's just, so there's that. We also do a thing with uh, spatial organization about where you are in space, that you're touching a bunch of little blue dots on a, on a board. And how quick can you get to those? How accurate are you when you get to those? 
And so these are each one of these things speak to a specific area of the brain or they speak to an area of the brain overall. And what I find mostly in our patients that we end up seeing, it's not that there's overt problems in one area of the brain. It kind of works like a computer network. And if each one of us in here had a computer that worked perfectly, yet there was no internet to connect the two of them or all the multiple computers, we couldn't send an email, right? Even though we have perfectly working machines. So if those networks in between those things aren't working, we can do things that the testing will show that, hey, here's where the problem is. We can stand up fine, but if I have you stand up and do some math, you become and get all wobbly. Okay, this is networking ability. This isn't that if I have you sit down and I have you do that same math problem, it's not a problem for you. Okay, so that area works, this area works, but when we try and do both of them, we have dysfunction, which is life, right? I get up, I, want, I walk into my kitchen, I wanna know what I'm gonna do in my kitchen. Right, so you gotta be able to do these things together in order for it to work. And if you can't, your brain's gonna default to making sure you can stand up much more than it is going to to remembering. Does that help? A lot. How much does hearing affect? Your, your hearing affects a whole lot, right? And we started with that just with our ability to understand what someone said, right? If I'm telling you to remember a list of things and you hear it completely different or you don't hear it at all, you're not going to remember that, okay? Your hearing also gives your brain some information about where you are in space. You know, where is this loud noise coming from, right? So if we're all sitting here and 90% of us have no hearing loss in our right ear and 10% of us do and a bear growls in the hallway, once again, the 90% of us that can hear it are going to get away, okay? The 10% that can't, eh, lunch, <laughs> you, you know? And so hearing affects it greatly. Yeah, and that doesn't mean hearing loss leads to Alzheimer's. Keep 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 that to, you know. So a lot of a lot of our things that are healthcare syndromes, a lot of symptoms overlap. So like in the majority of my patients, I could give you probably 15 different symptoms that the majority of them have, and I could have 10 different patients, and there'd be 10 different reasons of why they have it. Well, it could be. It, it could be just, you know, the ear itself. I mean, they, they, you'd be surprised how many people can show up to their doctor saying, I can't hear as well as I used to, and their ears so, so clogged to dirt and crud because they like to use a Q-tip to clean it out. It, and it's really, there's nothing wrong neurologically. There's nothing wrong with the ear. It's, you got your finger in it. You know, so it's, it's all over the place. But I don't want you to take from that chart that hearing loss equals Alzheimer's disease. That's the biggest thing. But yes, the inability to hear affects your ability to remember greatly. All right, well, thank you. I think Dr. Hubbard will be here for a few minutes after if anybody else has any questions. Um, thank you so much for all the information oh, today. This was great. And thank you. Thank you. If, if anybody is interested in learning a little bit more in depth, like I said, there's a sign-up sheet at the back to sign up. It's a three-week um, master class on the brain um, that Dr. Hubbard um, will be leading. So there's that. You can sign up in the back or upstairs. Also, please, if you can, fill out the survey um, evaluations. Okay, I'll make this very brief. Um, I'm Connie. I'm a volunteer. To